Welcome back to our first panel session. And so the panel number one is all about technology in the future. That's our theme. We've got speakers talking about crypto economy, about artificial intelligence and the tax policy, and then also electric vehicles. And so firstly, I'd like to invite up from Interstate, we're very lucky to have Elizabeth Morton, also Ken Nevis. Um, and so Elizabeth, you can pass it over to you to Mrs. Oak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There you go, so just that's forward there. Do you want to hold the mic? Or uh, or? Yeah, just put it there, it's fine. <laughs> And I need it to stay fairly close. Oh, yeah. You've had 20 minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Ken, um, for making me do all the work. <laughs> no, no, I should actually thank Ken because he presented for me uh, last week um, <laughs> uh, at the last minute. So, um, no, thank you uh, for having me today. Um, so, coming from RMIT from uh, Swinburne as well, we're talking about a crypto project we've been undertaking. Um, it's funded by AFAN, so acknowledgement to them for, for supporting this project. And also just to note that this is actually a bigger project than what we're presenting today. So it's essentially that first step where we have um, interviewed uh, a number of uh, accountants and practitioners to initially get essentially a state of play of, of what's happening from a practitioner point of view, from actually a compliance perspective. So whilst um, I'm exploring crypto today in this presentation, I'm not really delving into the mechanics of blockchain, so um, don't panic there. Um, <laughs> or, you know, you might be a little bit disappointed. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about how, how that relationship between actually getting uh, a compliance perspective, getting an accountant perspective in dealing with clients who, who are having uh, having fun and playing in this space. So this is a bit of a first there. So we've already done the acknowledgement of country today. So um, in particular, uh, as a bit of a background, um, obviously uh, accounting, taxation, uh, they're really regulated spaces and that creates a whole new level of complexity when we're dealing with the new technology like blockchain. Um, there's obviously, um, with, with any development, it takes time and that, that's important too because of the fact that um, um, we need to get that right, we need to be cautious, we need to have it well thought through and understand the web of complexity of, of various uh, regulatory frameworks that operate concurrently. Um, so, so that is all well and good, however that lag can create a lot of drama, um, particularly if we look at blockchain, uh, the activities that taxpayers are undertaking and then the tax practitioners who have to then explain to the client about the tax implications of those activities um, and then also understand and what's actually going on in, in that blockchain uh, exploration the clients are doing to actually work out, okay, what are the implications? And um, we're looking at the fact that we're, we have very uh, long uh, established tax principles, for example, who which um, you know have developed over time through laws that, that are very, very, the, the legislation itself that is very, very uh, well established to the judiciary to interpret the words of that legislation. Um, and, and then the guidance that the ATO um, provides to, to make sense of the picture and to provide essentially a, a working um, map for, for activities. But then throw in these novel things like um, crypto kitties, like um, uh, <laughs> I could go on to some really strange things. <laughs> um, obviously, Bitcoin being the, the first uh, uh, most obvious uh, that comes to mind uh, in, in over the years. But we're getting to some really crazy things, some really gamified type notions and activities that don't really look like normal things that we would have had to have dealt with as tax accountants, as accountants, as um regulators and having to understand the, the tax implications. So it, it's a really different space to be working. Um, and uh, there's obviously implications here, particularly as we hone into tax practitioners in this project that um, uh, that need to, to be able to do their job, uh, thinking about the TASA code of conduct uh, for practitioners that have to comply with, being able to be competent, um, being able to apply the law. Well, how can you do that if your client is undertaking blockchain activity and you don't understand 
what that activity actually is, or that uh, if they're undertaking uh, decentralised finance on one platform versus another, although they're kind of the same, they're actually quite different and actually understanding each particular uh, crypto asset that's being held, whether it's Bitcoin, which is a lot more straightforward than uh, moon cats or crypto kitties or um, hash masks or, you know, these all wonderful things that we can uh, go Google and think, what on earth is that? What's a cute little uh, picture? And that's worth how much? <laughs> uh, you know, because although it sounds really funny, there's like a lot of experimentation, there's huge dollar values um, uh, invested on blockchain, although in the last couple of months <laughs> it's tanked a little bit and there's been a lot of drama. So um, whilst uh, there can be really a, a lot of big dollars being spent, there can be a lot of dollars being lost, but also unlike share trading and share investing where you might have to spend five or $500 or $600 to, to get involved, you can do incredibly complex things with about $5, about $2. You don't really need much to actually do this kind of activity. So the level of complexity doesn't really match necessarily the level of investment by um, these taxpayers. So this obviously has slow on implications for the education needs of tax, uh, future tax practitioners as well. So just as a, a bit of a, a snapshot of the guidance at the moment, um, the ATO have produced a number of uh, tax determinations to explain uh, their position on a lot of, uh, largely stemming from Bitcoin and similar crypto assets. They recently, in the last few days, updated their guidance to describe them more generally, more broadly, as crypto assets as opposed to cryptocurrencies, because uh, assets here can be anything from credentialing to, to kind of like money, to, to tickets, to artwork, to gaming, um, pretty much anything you can think of and more. So um, it's broadening the horizons of what we're even speaking about by simply shifting from cryptocurrency to a crypto asset term. Um, but the, the tax, tax determinations here reflect a 2014 position and that's been fairly strong and standard. There's been a few changes. Um, GST, uh, the tax determination was withdrawn. We've seen a little bit of movement in, in the fringe benefit characterisation, really stemming to whether there's an effective salary sacrifice arrangement in place or not. That obviously has, um, reflecting on super, as we spoke about earlier, about implications for whether uh, crypto paid as wages um, forms part of your um, ordering time to earning. But largely, uh, the, the 2014 uh, slash 15, and, uh, sorry, 25 and 26, the foreign currency and CGT asset are the most kind of notable here. Um, and you may have seen in uh, the news recently about the fact that the government is going to make certain that Bitcoin is not a foreign currency. Their position is that, which stems from their 2014 uh, tax determination. But since then, there's been a lot of developments. In particular, um, uh, we did have, for example, an administrative uh, tribunal case that confirmed that this same position, but then the following year, El Salvador accepted uh, uh, Bitcoin as, as legal tender, which kind of starts throwing a little bit of murkiness in the baseline of their interpretation and other uh, jurisdictions as well about whether Bitcoin is actually recognised um, uh, uh, by a sovereign nation as, as legal tender, and it kind of is. So that's a little bit of confusion and uncertainty. So the government confirming that they will make certain that it is not. Um, obviously creates a level of certainty, but Bitcoin is one of many kinds of assets. Whilst it ensures that it falls within the CGT regime, it, it, it's only one of the assets involved and um, there's a lot of complexity beyond Bitcoin itself. Um, so they do have their website guidance. Obviously, it doesn't have the same level of reliance capability as the tax determinations. They're, they're getting updated every so often. As I said just the other day, we've got some increased examples, a little bit of change in terminology. Um, but even the ATO guidance is a little bit slow. Um, and we've, we saw in, in a report led by Andrew Bragg that came out last year that that was a real concern and um, and noting of the fact that that needs to be a little bit more prompt uh, to assist um, practitioners and taxpayers. Um, but again, from uh, 
from a point of view that, that this is a, there's a lot of confusion here. Um, and in that Bragg report, it actually highlighted that 25% that of Australians have either held or hold crypto assets. So that's potentially extrapolating that, thinking about one in four of a tax practitioner's clients could be investing. So this is becoming uh, not so much just that fad. It, you know, it, it's actually becoming more significant uh, of, of an issue for tax practitioners, for accountants to actually have some kind of awareness. Um, uh, so so what, what, what we're seeking to do is really explore um, this space, understand the tax practitioner's perspective here, understand the, the necessary uh, skills and, and competencies um, for this space, um, and, and really the, the pervasiveness um, of that. And um, so uh, we've, we've begun interviewing, uh, we've interviewed 12 um, accountants or practitioners, um, and we're about to um, uh, send out a survey to really expand on this. Um, so this is really, uh, in a sense, a preliminary snapshot of findings, obviously also contemplating a uh, document analysis of what's happening out there as well. With respect to um, the findings that, that we've uh, really kind of reflected on is, is that there is a, a younger demographic coming through here that, that are, are um, a large portion of the clients involved in crypto. Um, and we've got to be mindful that there's a, a range of firms in, in operating across Australia that, that may have absolutely no clients at all in this space, at least that they're aware of or yet um, at the point of, of, of speaking with them, all the way through to those practices that are really orientated for crypto clients. So there can be those that are really at the forefront, whilst those are still um, not quite there yet. They, you know, the, the description is, well, you know, if I ask my clients about blockchain, they'll be wondering if it's a chain, you know, being dragged by a tractor or something. <laughs> <laughs> so there was really, a, you know, a, a real variation uh, across the space of, of where, um, where firms are at, um, whether they're proactive or, or whether they're actually waiting for the profession to really guide uh, until, until the profession really highlights it as an issue, until their clients really push them for it, they're not really doing anything yet. But there was, there's certainly a growing number of, of practitioners out there that are really involved and really, in, in, you know, really active um, and really focused on, on this space. Um, in saying that, as I said, the clients are, are, are largely younger, often males, um, and, and often risk takers. But whilst you know, there's a theory that it can be lucrative. Um, often, a lot of them are described as simply dabbling. Um, instead of buying a lottery ticket, they'll be investing um, instead in um, a little bit of crypto. Um, so just getting a little bit of play, a little bit of exposure. Um, and so not necessarily a gold rush. Perhaps those invested years ago or those that are really pushing much more of a business um, trading uh, story, um, a lot of it isn't necessarily going to cause a, a high level of um, uh, tax pain. Um, but mind you, um, it does raise the concern that when tax practitioners are telling their clients, okay, this is the tax implications of what you're doing, um, this is a reasonably arguable position, they may not like it. And they uh, and, and it raises questions about the level of engagement um, with clients, whether um, tax practitioners should be engaging with those clients, um, seeking, uh, um, telling them, look, if you don't like this, uh, my advice, um, you don't have to take it, and, and being accepting of losing clients. But in the same sense, that if they're not enough, they, they don't have enough knowledge in this space, if they don't understand the technology enough, they may not be able to advise on this, and they may have to be seeking, uh, telling, telling clients actually go to another firm or say, oh, you know, this person knows it, so we can't advise on this. But as we progress, as a technology uh, advances, do tax practitioners have the capability to keep on doing that? They're going to start losing clients, and then can they operate? Um, what's their long-term perspective here if, if they're turning away clients time and time again as a growing proportion um, are delving in the space? 
So, so there's obviously um, the risk from, from a tax practice point of view um, about not taking these up. Um, but in saying that, as I mentioned before, you may only excellent. <laughs> you may only be able to, uh, you know, they may be dabbling in really minor amounts, but it's still taking tax practitioners a long time, hours. Um, and so the cost benefit here of, of actually being able to attend to these clients can be really challenging as well. Um, and so there's a balance here. There's obviously uh, crypto reports they can obtain as a starting point, um, but they're not on uh, as sufficient for, for, for practitioners to use in isolation. It's a conversation starter. It's, it's a point to begin reconciliation. Um, so, so there's a lot of issues that, that span um, uh, across the, the engagement spaces as well, ensuring that the taxpayer themselves understand their rights and obligations um, and, and, and the difficulty in reconciling knowledge from a tax perspective and knowledge um, of the blockchain nature. So there's definitely concern about the level um, of uh, guidance that the, the, the ATO is providing, but the point here is not only understanding the tax law, but learning how to understand what the ATO interprets. And so there's that distinction there about it's not just the law, it's about what the ATO really wants the law, the law or how they interpret it that's really, really critical here. Um, and, and so there is, with, with the skills and competencies, um, needing to know the key, uh, the blockchain technology, um, how it works, um, being a necessary uh, component of a tax practice um, with clients in this space. Um, there's also a need uh, uh, to, to communicate with clients and be proactive as well and the imbalance between the skill set between the client and, and, and the practitioner. Um, the and this requires a level of, of reasonable care um, to, to apply the law correctly, but understanding that no one quite knows yet how the law applies. Um, for example, in decentralised finance, um, the crystallisation of earnings is, is really a point of contention um, um, uh, that's raising uh, a lot of concern in the profession. Um, the ATO data matching is obviously a point where clients are actually coming to practitioners. Um, so, so whilst the ATO data matching is really, really important, but it's still uh, in its early uh, development in particular, there's concern of the pre-field report um, not really being sufficiently accurate or sufficiently in depth. Um, so it's really only a conversation uh, starter as well. Um, and, and the concern that, that um, whilst it encourages compliance, the, the level of information um, can be challenging. So just on a couple of uh, points to bring this all together without going into too much detail and findings. So, so there is a, a compliance challenge with the level of, of, of guidance being on offer, but that links to the fact that there's a lag um, in in, in, in the law here, um, and it's about learning out about how we actually apply traditional principles to really novel circumstances. Um, there's, there's certainly risk to compliance, and this can also be a part where there's a, a lot of trust in the taxpayer being open. Whilst blockchain technology is transparent, there's obviously a need for, for wallets to be declared, for, for the level of detail to be declared. Um, um, and the story goes beyond just what's on blockchain. We, to apply uh, tax law principles, we need to know about intention. We need to know uh, the use. There's a lot more than what is literally on blockchain. Um, and and there, there can be difficulty in that reconciliation between knowledge. Um, so, so there's difficult decisions at the moment. And whilst we've seen a small baby step with the government introducing that certainty uh, with respect to foreign currency, at the moment tax practitioners are really facing difficulty in ensuring they've done uh, enough to satisfy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that uh, that adaptability, that responsiveness, uh, the, the lack of sufficient PD or explicit PD often stems from the fact that it's it's really dynamic. It's it's really hard to be deep diving in particular areas of blockchain because really the issues are specific and can be different based on the different client activities. Um, and, and ATO pro proactivity is really key here. 
Um, so this obviously links into some really good opportunities for higher education, for example, because it can be really exciting and fun. It can really open up some interesting conversations with students and get them to be critically thinking um, about how the law applies, about their interpretation of being really mindful of this at the same time that the practitioners are actually doing it themselves. So I think it's a really exciting time um, to learn tax as well. Um, so as I said, it is a small scale interview set at the moment, um, following up um, with survey to really test those findings and really concrete that further. But it is becoming pervasive, uh, even if we're in crypto winter and we've seen some really dark moments in the last few months, really questioning it. Um, I know Neil questioned it to be even near uh, super funds, but uh, uh, there's certainly some interesting conversations being had. I'll leave it there.